Hey guys, welcome back. This is chapter seven of readings from Gift of the Shaper. Today we're doing chapter seven, which is the Talvin Forest, north of Highglade. Thornton awoke to the sound of the Kinari talking in low, rough tones. The first rays of light had already broken across the horizon, and Thornton could see them facing the road with their backs to him. He turned his head to see Mira asleep, just a few feet from him. Rubbing the sleep from his eyes with his knuckles, he stood up and began folding his blanket, trying not to wake her. He finished, putting it on the ground next to the packs of the Kinari. He walked over to Jericho and Matilda, who were nibbling on a nearby patch of grass. Giving them each a small pat on the head, he strained his ears to see if he could make out what Catherus and Inara were saying, but only caught fragments of words. He was sure he heard them say, Kith, at least a half dozen times. Catherus raised his voice to say, She must be protected, and both of them fell silent. Mira stirred from her sleep, and the Kinari noticed. They came back to their makeshift camp and sat down. I'm sorry if we woke you, Catherus started. But we need to get moving. We've rested long enough, and the sun has already begun its climb. Thornton looked puzzled. What's that got to do with anything? Kethris stared at him uncomfortably, like he had let slip a secret he would rather not reveal. After a pause, he said, When we met, do you remember the first thing I said to you? Thornton thought about it for a moment. You told me to put out my light. Do you remember why? You said you couldn't see. Kethris nodded. But I don't understand, Thornton said. It wasn't that bright. Not bright, Kethris said. Hot. The same light seemed to come on in Thornton's mind as he slowly realized why the Kinari were such excellent night hunters. They didn't use light to see at night. They used heat. You're saying you can't see during the day? Kethris looked annoyed and answered, Of course we can see. I'm looking at you now, aren't I? He crossed his arms in protest. We merely prefer our night vision to that of the daytime. Light can play tricks on the eyes, but heat does not lie. Inara spoke up. But time is running short, and trails do not last forever. Gathering himself up, Kethris said gruffly, Enough talk. We must go. Coffee break. Kethris walked over to his packs and picked them up, slinging his bow across his back and slipping dagger after dagger into sheaths tied neatly across his body. Thornton watched him, the tall creature covered completely in fine black fur, and understood why they would prefer the dark of night. Inara came up behind Thornton and whispered, He doesn't like to be reminded that he has a weakness. She smiled at him gently and stooped to pick up her things. She pulled out a few pieces of bread from her pack and passed them around. By now, Mira was up and awake as well, and had folded both blankets neatly and placed them on the backs of the horses. She happily accepted the piece of bread as she finished packing the rest of her things. Dawn came streaming forth as the dark of night had turned into morning twilight. Kethris led them all back onto the road and oriented them north. Thornton couldn't decide which would make him sorer, if he kept riding or if he got off to walk. For the moment, he opted to go on foot, since the pace they were keeping was moderate. The Kinari, as always, were walking. He wondered if either of them knew how to ride a horse at all, then laughed to himself when he tried to picture it. The day was warm, even for summer, so he was continually wiping sweat from his forehead and pushing his damp brown hair back behind his ears. Mira had tied hers back, which had absolutely fascinated Inara, since her own hair was the same length all over. Ever since they started traveling together, Inara had become obsessed with Mira's hair, constantly finding an excuse to touch it and run her fingers through it. Other times she would just watch as Mira put it up, only to ask her to put it down again so she could watch as she shook her head, sending her beautiful golden locks tumbling down to her shoulders. Inara was entranced by it, and Mira was nice enough to indulge her. Kethris had no time for any of that and chose instead to keep his eyes on the road and his ears alert. When they stopped to let the horses eat and rest, he was constantly on the lookout. He wanted to make sure that if they were being followed, they would be ready to defend themselves. At one point, he stopped to examine a group of tracks on the road that appeared to be leading west. 
When he noticed Thornton casually glancing at him as he investigated, he called him over. Tell me what you can about these tracks, the Kinari said. There was one on horseback, Thornton said, pointing to the hoof prints. It may be two or three people walking. Good, but look here, Kethris said, pointing at a set of hoof prints. These go deeper into the dirt than the other set, yet they are the same size. He looked at Thornton, waiting for him to connect the pieces. Someone was riding it, on a second horse, Thornton answered slowly. Very good, Kethris said. The tracks look to have been made in the mud. See how they go deeper in than our tracks do? More of the road was pushed away because it was soft and wet. They were traveling just after a rain. Thornton was impressed. Always keep the track between you and the sun, Kethris went on, still looking at the ground. You can catch tiny imperfections in the shadow of the track, and if you're good, you can tell the difference between one track and another. There were four people walking, he said as he stood. He looked over to see that the horses had finished grazing. Inara and Mira were talking idly, with Inara occasionally reaching out and flipping the ends of Mira's hair, smiling like a child with a new toy. Thornton, still studying the tracks, asked, What if these tracks were made by the people who took my father? Kethra stood with his, with his back to Thornton. That's one possibility. If there's a chance we could find him, we have to take it. Kethris turned and looked at him, then back to Inara and Mira, who were still talking and smiling. I cannot guarantee these tracks will lead us to your father. Thornton stood up. Then let's see where they lead. Kethris nodded, then walked over to Inara and Mira to tell them the plan. Thornton walked back over to Jericho and climbed onto his back, hoping that they could make good time. If it was not his father's trail they were following, they could at least find out quickly. Thanks for stopping by for the reading of Chapter 7. It was a pretty short one, and there wasn't really a whole lot going on there except for the, the tracking portion of it. Uh, which I definitely ha had to uh, do some Googling and, and figure out exactly how to track. Uh, I am by no means a tracker. I didn't do so well in land navigation when I went to uh, Seer School, like I'd mentioned in one of the earlier chapters. So I am, I'm definitely not the kind of person you'd, you, would, you would want on your team. I'm not a Kethris. I am more of a Thornton. Stay with me here. But if you haven't checked out chapters 1 through 6 already, there is a playlist. It's just titled Gift of the Shaper, and it's publicly shared under... Uh, under my YouTube channel under playlists, so go ahead and check it out if you got some time to kill. Uh, otherwise, uh, try and check back. I, I usually try and do these about once a week, so hopefully I'll see you guys next time. This is a good book.